Good evening. My name is Kevin Oltaniu, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Design for the Buckley Program at Yale. Today, I have the immense pleasure of introducing Jeff Greenfield. Mr. Greenfield, a native of New York City, graduated with honors from the University of Wisconsin, where he was the editor-in-chief of the Daily Cardinal. Afterwards, he graduated, graduated with honors from the Yale Law School, where he was note and comment editor of the Yale Law Journal. Following law school, Mr. Greenfield worked as a speechwriter in the Senate ODIC and Robert Kennedy's 1968 presidential campaign. He then worked as chief speechwriter for New York City Mayor John Lindsay. Then for 15 years, he worked as a columnist and his work has appeared in more than 150 newspapers. His work has also been published in magazines including the New York Times Magazine, Harper's, Esquire, and National Lampoon. Mr. Greenfield has authored or co-authored 13 books, including national bestseller The People's Choice, A Cautionary Tale, which was published in 1995 and was named by the New York Times Book Review as one of the most notable books of the year. In addition to working as a print journalist and being a best-selling author, Mr. Greenfield is a veteran political media and culture reporter and analyst, and has spent 30 plus years at CBS, CNN, ABC, and PBS. Among other roles, he has served as a lead analyst for primaries, conventions, presidential debates, and election nights, as well as presidential funerals and Supreme Court confirmation hearings. He has served as a floor reporter or anchor booth analyst for every single national convention since 1988. Mr. Greenfield has also appeared on several episodes of William F. Buckley Jr.'s show, Firing Line. Currently, Mr. Greenfield works as a columnist for the Daily Beast and Politico and as a contributing correspondent for PBS NewsHour. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jeff Greenfield. Evening. Uh, that was a terrific debate this afternoon, Mr. Cudlow, Mr. Roach. Uh, I guess Paul Krugman's invitation got lost in the mail. <laughs> Can't trust these government-run enterprises. If you could send it FedEx, it would have gotten there. <laughs> Should also say that uh, while we're here to pay tribute to Bill Buckley, I had a critical role that very few people know in helping Jim Buckley get elected to the U.S. Senate. I was working for his opponent, <laughs> and it worked. Uh, the personal link I have uh, with Firing Line and with Bill Buckley actually began here, a few blocks from here, half a century ago, because I wanted to eat. Um, I was on a very tight budget in law school. I had exceeded my funds, and I literally was dead broke. Not Hillary Clinton dead broke. <laughs> I was dead broke. I convinced the Yale Alumni Magazine to advance me the sum of $125 uh, to write a piece about Bill Buckley's visit to campus where he was going to debate William Sloan Coffin, the left-leaning uh, chaplain. Left-leaning in the sense that the Lusitania was left-leaning uh, before it <laughs> sank beneath the waves. And in writing the piece, I, I was inspired by the work of a writer who was becoming very well known in those days, a, a writer who was breaking the conventions of Olympian neutrality journalism, embedding himself in the story, filling it with detail and attitude. Some people actually called it the new journalism. I wonder what ever happened to that guy. <laughs> but anyway, I, ran, I wrote the piece. Buckley said it, it was amusing. And a couple of years later, Warren Stibel, I guess, called me and said, uh, you know, we're putting people with different views, young people, long ago, would you like to be on Firing Line? And so I found myself there. If you look at me on YouTube, you will see the world's oldest, stiffest 25-year-old you can possibly imagine. <laughs> um, but what struck me about it was that it was a kind of symbol about Buckley. The show reflected his own notion, I think, that this was not going to be the amen corner. Uh, that there were going to be disparate views. Um, you saw some of them. One of the things that struck me from the beginning was the number of, of, of black dissidents. Muhammad Ali as a draft resistor, Huey Newton, um, Julian Bond. Um, now, let me be very blunt with you. I think in part this may have been an act of compensation because and I, I want to be as blunt as I can. Civil rights and race was not the National Review's finest hour. In fact, it was their darkest hour. 
When National Review wrote that the white minority in the South should keep political control because it was the advanced race, this was not a good moment. Jack Kemp himself said some years later, we, conservatives, should have been in the streets of Montgomery and Selma. And I think to some extent, firing line was a way of Bill Buckley maybe making up for that by putting on voices that very few other people on television were putting on at the time to, to be heard and to debate. And I thought that was a high mark in his favor. I think it also reflects the fact that he could be friends with people like Al Lowenstein, the liberal congressman, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith that you know, Murray Kempton, the late and great uh, socialist writer. He liked that idea. And one of the things that was really great fun about being on Firing Line was that if one of us, one of the challengers, managed to make a point against one of his guests who shared Bill's views, he didn't cover up. He didn't say, well, let's move on. He would pursue that. He said, now that's interesting. And he would turn to the guest, what's your answer to that? And what that reflected to me was the heart and soul of the show and of Bill Buckley, that the zest that he had for everything, for food, for a good communist Cuban cigar, as his wife called him, <laughs> for music. He had Rosalind Turek on uh, at one point, and, and as you know, the, the show begins with the Brandenburg Concerto number two, I think. But that zest, that zest also enveloped how he would go after an argument. Even if the argument challenged one of his deepest beliefs, if it was well put and well framed, he would delight in it. Now to be on that show um, taught me a couple of things. Uh, one of them was you, <laughs> you are capable of being highly embarrassed uh, if you're not prepared. I, uh, Margaret Thatcher was on the show, having just become the conservative leader in Britain. And I asked her, uh, was being a woman, did, what kind of role did that play in your ascension to your leadership? Did it help? Did it hurt? And she said, do you mind if I tell you that that's an exceedingly stupid question? <laughs> no, I don't mind. Go right ahead. <laughs> the other thing that's, that, that I learned very early and unintentionally was that, that while Bill Buckley, as Tom and others have mentioned, had a powerful and successful role in changing the political dialogue, when it came to the culture wars, it wasn't quite that successful. And an early indication of that was that when I first joined Firing Line, I was a liberal. The other two young people were conservatives. They were members of the Young Americans for Freedom, the group that Bill Buckley had helped create and that subsequently became very famous as the role model for the Niedermeyer fraternity in Animal House. Sorry, guys. Um, well, I came in one day, and the two women, one man was a man and a woman. They were actually going out. I said, uh, what happened? And one of the people on the show said, um, they've actually gone off to follow the Grateful Dead. And it occurred to me that if two members of the Young Americans for Freedom had gone off to follow the Grateful Dead, the culture was cooked, essentially. <laughs> I had a spectacular time at Firing Line. It helped me in that when I somehow stumbled into journalism on television with no training, you know, if you begin your career at, on television at age 25 arguing with Bill Buckley, Wolf Blitzer holds no terror. <laughs> and the second thing was I got to be friends with him and got to experience this man who lived life in a way that very few of us get to do. I asked my wife, um, who fell in love with Bill Buckley, despite some pesky little political differences, what do you think I should say about him? She said, you've got to tell people, remind people, this man lived life to the fullest. He sucked everything out of it. He delighted in every day, whether on his ship, listening to music, having a meal, having a conversation. He, he pursued life with, in a way that most of us can only hope to achieve. And for me, being on firing line maybe more than anything else taught me not so much about television, but about life. If, if, if you want the key to living a life as rich as possible, William F. Buckley's not a bad guy to follow. Thank you.